absurd walls. Like great works, deep feelings always mean more than they are conscious of saying. The regularity of an impulse or a repulsion in a soul is encountered again in habits of doing or thinking, is reproduced in consequences of which the soul itself knows nothing. Great feelings take with them their own universe, splendid or abject. They light up with their passion an exclusive world in which they recognize their climate. There is a universe of jealousy, of ambition, of selfishness, or of generosity. A universe, in other words, a metaphysic and an attitude of mind. What is true of already specialized feelings will be even more so of emotions basically as indeterminate, simultaneously as vague and as definite, as remote and as present as those furnished us by beauty or aroused by absurdity. At any street corner, the feeling of absurdity can strike any man in the face. As it is in its distressing nudity, in its light without effulgence, it is elusive. But that very difficulty deserves reflection. It is probably true that a man remains forever unknown to us, and that there is in him something irreducible that escapes us. But practically I know men and recognize them by their behavior, by their totality of their deeds, by the consequences caused in life by their presence. Likewise, all those irrational feelings which offer no purchase to analysis, I can define them practically, appreciate them practically by gathering together the sum of their consequences in the domain of the intelligence, by seizing and noting all their aspects, by outlining their universe. It is certain that, apparently, though I have seen the same actor a hundred times, I shall not, for that reason, know him any better, personally. Yet, if I add up the heroes he has personified, and if I say that I know him a little better at the hundredth character counted off, this will be felt to contain an element of truth. For this apparent paradox is also an apologue. There is a moral to it. It teaches that a man defines himself by his make-believe, as well as by his sincere impulses. There is thus a lower key of feelings, inaccessible in the heart but partially disclosed by the acts they imply and the attitudes of mind they assume. It is clear that in this way I am defining a method, but it is also evident that that method is one of analysis and not of knowledge. For method implies metaphysics. Unconsciously they disclose conclusions that they often claim not to know yet. Similarly, the last pages of a book are already contained in the first pages. Such a link is inevitable. The method defined here acknowledges the feeling that all true knowledge is impossible. Solely, appearances can be enumerated, and the climate make itself felt. Perhaps we shall be able to overtake that elusive feeling of absurdity in the different but closely related worlds of intelligence, of the art of living, or of art itself. The climate of absurdity is in the beginning. The end is the absurd universe and that attitude of mind which lights the world with its true colours to bring out the privileged and implacable visage which that attitude has discerned in it. All great deeds and all great thoughts have a ridiculous beginning. Great works are often born on a street corner or in a restaurant's revolving door. So it is with absurdity. The absurd world, more than others, derives its nobility from that abject birth. 
In certain situations, replying nothing when asked what one is thinking about may be pretense in a man. Those who are loved are well aware of this. But if that reply is sincere, if it symbolizes that odd state of soul in which the void becomes eloquent, in which the chain of daily gestures is broken, in which the heart vainly seeks the link that will connect it again, then it is, as it were, the first sign of absurdity. It happens that the stage sets collapse, Rising, tram, four hours in the office or factory, meal, tram, four hours of work, meal, sleep, and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, according to the same rhythm. This path is easily followed most of the time. But one day, the why arises, and everything begins in that weariness tinged with amazement. Begins, this is important, weariness comes at the end of the acts of a mechanical life, but at the same time it inaugurates the impulse of consciousness. It awakens consciousness and provokes what follows. What follows is the gradual return into the chain, or it is the definitive awakening. At the end of the awakening comes, in time, the consequence suicide or recovery. In itself, wariness has something sickening about it. Here, I must conclude that it is good, for everything begins with a consciousness and nothing is worth anything except through it. There is nothing original about these remarks, but they are obvious. That is enough for a while, during a sketchy reconnaissance in the origins of the absurd. Mere anxiety, as Heidegger says, is at the source of everything. Likewise, and during every day of an unillustrious life, time carries us. But a moment always comes when we have to carry it. We live on the future. Tomorrow, later on, when you have made your way, you will understand when you are old enough. Such irrelevancies are wonderful, for, after all, it's a matter of dying. Yet a time comes when a man notices or says that he is thirty. Thus he asserts his youth, but simultaneously he situates himself in relation to time. He takes his place in it. He admits that he stands at a certain point on a curve that he acknowledges having to travel to its end. He belongs to time, and by the horror that seizes him, he recognizes his worst enemy. Tomorrow. He was longing for tomorrow, whereas everything in him ought to reject it. The revolt of the flesh is the absurd. A step lower and strangeness creeps in. Perceiving that the world is dense, sensing to what degree a stone is foreign and irreducible to us, with what intensity nature or a landscape can negate us. At the heart of all beauty lies something inhuman, and these hills, the softness of the sky, the outline of these trees at this very minute, lose the illusory meaning with which we had clothed it, henceforth more remote than a lost paradise. The primitive hostility of the world rises up to face us across millennia. For a second we cease to understand it because for centuries we have understood in it solely the images and designs that we had attributed to it beforehand. Because henceforth we lack the power to make use of that artifice. The world evades us because it becomes itself again. The stage scenery masked by habit becomes again what it is. It withdraws at a distance from us, just as there are days when under the familiar face of a woman we see a stranger. 
her we had loved months or years ago. Perhaps we shall come even to desire what suddenly leaves us so alone. But the time has not yet come. Just one thing. That denseness and that strangeness of the world is the absurd. Men, too, secrete the inhuman. At certain moments of lucidity, the mechanical aspect of their gestures, their meaningless pantomime, makes silly everything that surrounds them. A man is talking on the telephone behind a glass partition. You cannot hear him, but you see his incomprehensible dumb show. You wonder why he is alive. The discomfort in the face of the man's own inhumanity. This incalculable tumble before the image of what we are. This nausea, as a writer of today calls it, is also the absurd. Likewise, the stranger who at certain seconds comes to meet us in a mirror. The familiar and yet alarming brother we encounter in our own photographs is also the absurd. I come at last to death and to the attitude we have toward it. On this point, everything has been said and it is only proper to avoid pathos. Yet one will never be sufficiently surprised that everyone lives as if no one knew. This is because, in reality, there is no experience of death. Properly speaking, nothing has been experienced but what has been lived and made conscious. Here, it is barely possible to speak of the experience of others' deaths. It is a substitute, an illusion, and it never quite convinces us. That melancholy convention cannot be persuasive. The horror comes in reality from the mathematical aspect of the event. If time frightens us, this is because it works out the problem and the solution comes afterwards. All the pretty speeches about the soul will have their contrary convincingly proved, at least for a time, from this inert body on which a slap makes no mark the soul has disappeared. This elementary and definitive aspect of the adventure constitutes the absurd feeling. Under the fatal lighting of that destiny, its uselessness becomes evident. No code of ethics and no effort are justifiable a priori in the face of the cruel mathematics that command our condition. Let me repeat, all this has been said over and over. I am limiting myself here to make a rapid classification and to pointing out these obvious themes. They run through all literatures and all philosophies. Everyday conversation feeds on them. There is no question of reinventing them. But it is essential to be sure of these facts in order to be able to question oneself subsequently on the primordial question. I am interested, let me repeat again, not so much in absurd discoveries as in their consequences. If one is assured of these facts, what is one to conclude? How far is one to go to elude nothing? Is one to die voluntarily or to hope in spite of everything? Beforehand, it is necessary to take the same rapid inventory on the plane of the intelligence.